and, and welcome to our lecture event for alcohol withdrawal. Um, I want to welcome you all. Uh, we're really excited to have such a diverse crowd of physicians and nurses and pharmacists and um, our community physicians as well as our other um, community health care representatives. Um, you know, we have an incredible opportunity to address this patient population throughout the community. Uh, Watsonville Hospital is also looking at this benzo sparing protocol, so it's a great opportunity for continuity in how we treat these patients throughout our county. Um, I want to make sure that we thank the Dominican Foundation for their financial support tonight. Um, I want to thank our CME committee in helping to coordinate, and I want to thank the Health Improvement Partnership of Santa Cruz County for taking care of the video recording so we can have a video of this event as well. Um, so in terms of their Physicians and nurses sign in. The evaluations are what we're going to be using to give you, give you your continuing education credit, so make sure you complete your evaluations and hand those in at the registration table before you leave. Without that, we can't give you your CMEs and CNEs. Um, in the, for the evaluation forms, um, when you answer question number one, please tell us what, if anything, you plan to change as a result of attending this activity, and do not say all or everything. Try to be more specific, because we do want to take that feedback and, and you know, improve our processes. Um, and if we give you a follow-up form, it only has one question, and its purpose is to find out what changes you have made. Of course, our disclosure statement, um, it is the policy of Dominican Hospital, a Dignity Health member, to ensure fair balance, independence, objectivity, and scientific rigor in all its sponsored programs. All planners and presenters are expected to disclose any real or apparent conflicts of interest related to this presentation. And then you can see the back of the evaluation form um, for faculty and planner disclosures as well as commercial support. And then. Um, you know what, we're about to introduce Dr. Maldonado. Um, he is a physician and professor at Stanford um, Hospital. And I worked with Dr. Maldonado at Stanford um, with the Alcohol Withdrawal Task Force many, many years ago. And as a nurse, I had seen the effects of alcohol withdrawal on my patients as well as my colleagues. In fact, when I wanted to get involved is after I had two of my colleagues, their bedside nursing career was ended after being assaulted by alcohol withdrawal patients. So I really felt this passion, like we got to do something better for those patients and my colleagues. Um, and then I had read articles about anticonvulsants in the use of, of that patient population. And that's when I know that Dr. Maldonado was, Maldonado was getting ready to do this. I was really excited to join. Um, I do want to say that working with Dr. Maldonado, I learned a great deal about alcohol withdrawal and the neurotransmitters, although I can't really tell you, educate you guys about the neurotransmitters because he's the expert, but I did learn a lot. Um, I do have two things that struck me when working with him. Um, he truly is an advocate for the multidisciplinary approach in, um, in the practice and in the treatment of his patients. You know, he embraces whether it's physical therapy or the nursing or whoever it might be, and, and he is passionate about getting everyone involved and making sure that everyone communicates. And of course, you know, I, you see that, and the reason he does that is because he's so passionate about having the best possible outcomes for his patients. So um, without further ado, I welcome Dr. Jose Maldonado. <clears throat> Thank you, Karen. Uh, I usually have a difficult time staying on one spot, uh, but I believe that they're recording. So I'm going to try to stay, but if I move, then you know why. Um, uh, I'm a neuropsychiatrist. My training is on brain functioning. Unfortunately, as you all know, we usually treat the dysfunction part <clears throat> of any disorder. So brain dysfunction is what I do. And um, if you can see from here, I, I'm the immediate past president of the American Delirium Society. And even though I'm board certified in uh, addiction, I really, really never practiced the addiction part of uh, my boards, and I never intended to study alcohol withdrawal, ever. Um, but we were doing a study on delirium, and I got to alcohol withdrawal through delirium instead of the other way around. Uh, not just the delirium tremens that some patients develop with alcohol withdrawal, but the delirium that you and I cause every time we treat a patient with benzodiazepines in order to prevent alcohol withdrawal. So I have written many papers, and I please don't pull them on the internet because I know them well. 
um, saying that benzos are the treatment of choice for alcohol withdrawal. In fact, one of those papers got me promoted uh, from assistant to associate professor a few years ago. I was giving a talk a year and a half ago for the American College of Physicians, of all places, in um, Vegas. Um, there were 1,500 physicians there, and I was talking about alcohol withdrawal and telling them uh, that benzos are bad and that you should never use a benzo if you can afford it. Uh, and in the Q&A section, there's you know, microphones all over the room. A young whippersnapper comes over to the, to the microphone with a tablet and starts quoting one of my papers, talking about how great benzos are, without saying the name. He was very polite. He was like, well, this academician said this and that. And I remember saying, you know what? I know the author. He's a great guy. <laughs> but that was one of the worthless pieces of crap he ever written. It was the standard of care back then. And what I'm doing right now is acknowledging that still to this day, benzos are the treatment of choice. I mean, not the treatment of choice, the standard of care. The last time I personally used a benzo to treat alcohol withdrawal was exactly seven years ago, last July 1st. So we have not used a benzo since. We have had zero patients to date go through DTs. We have had zero seizures. We have had no patient transfer to the ICU. And best of all of them, we had not been sued yet. <laughs> um, now, do I, uh, am I telling you that ben the benzosporin protocol is perfect? Absolutely not. But, I'm, and I'm going to show you the data. The failure rate of the benzosporin protocol is significantly lower than that of benzodiazepines. Um, so disclosures, um, I have, you know, I'm, I'm owned and operated for the last 25 years by Stanford University, uh, which means that I'm poor. Um, <laughs> and they meet a past president of the American Delirium Society. And I want to warn you that everything that I'm going to tell you is uh, off label, all the medications that we're going to discuss. Now, of all, of all of you who follow academic careers, you know that it takes about 10 years from the moment a new medication or treatment is you know, found to be effective to the time that we physicians and nurses change our practice. So I'm hoping that it's only three years away uh, before we start treating our patients uh, better. And uh, like, it, like Karen said, I absolutely not mind um, uh, if you want to interrupt me and ask me a question. In fact, we have two hours. Um, if you have not seen give me giving a talk, I'm extremely kind of obsessive compulsive, so chances are your question is coming up in, in a future slide. But if it would make your head explode, I'd rather you ask the question <laughs> than, than go through that. So uh, let's get started. So alcohol use disorder is an extremely bad problem in medicine, right? We like to talk about the opiate addiction. Uh, these are opiates, that's heroin abuse right there, and this is alcohol. Alcohol is by far, in the United States and everywhere in the world, the number one drug of abuse and the number one problem. Not just in terms of overdoses, which is what we tend to think about when we think about opiates, but in terms of every other potential detrimental effect of alcohol, from cirrhosis to uh, the effect that it has in society, et cetera. Um, somewhere between 20 and 42% of the patients who are coming to the hospital will have some problem uh, with alcohol uh, withdrawal. And as you see, our uh, rate of successfully diagnosing and identifying those patients is pretty bad, which is why these patients run into trouble. Now, some patient populations, as you can see at the bottom of the, of the slide, have more problems than others. As you will expect, patients in the ER have a fairly high rate, about 40%. There are some patients that are significantly worse, as you will expect, Trauma victims is nearly 70%. And in fact, it is because of the acute intoxication that they usually get themselves uh, into the trauma itself. Now, I want to point out that both the alcohol withdrawal itself, as well as the treatment of alcohol withdrawal, are potential significant problems. So it's not just one. I should also point out, as you can see here, that you guys are at risk of alcohol withdrawal because our host did not give us alcohol today. And of course, drinking is one way to preventing alcohol withdrawal. And I'm going to tell you why that is a really bad idea. 
Um, that doesn't mean I don't drink. I just don't drink to excess. So we, we, all, we all know what a standard drink is, right? So it's either a can of beer, uh, eight ounces, sorry, a, uh, yeah, a can of beer, eight ounces of malt liquor, uh, and about one and a half ounce, which means one tumbler shot of pure alcohol or, or the average alcohol, right? So when you go to a good restaurant and you get only about one third of the glass of wine, that is because, not just because they're cheap, which they are, but because, you know, it is five ounces, what is one standard drink. Um, now, think about when you go to the Caribbean or any place where they serve a drink that has an umbrella on it. Um, <laughs> if you ever order a margarita, what do you get? You get somebody who probably called Pedro, who has two glasses and goes like that. Do you know how many ounces are there? More than a standard drink which is also what we get so drunk when you go to the islands. There's also another problem. This one says uh, uh, what I drink and what I tell the pollsters or the physicians uh, is two different things. And that's one thing that we need to remember. Our patients tend to minimize how much they drink for many reasons, one of which is they are ashamed that, you know, to tell you that they drink two bottles of wine a night is, you know, it seems like a lot when you think about it. Um, the other thing that you need to know is that there are different ways in which our body processes alcohol. Most of the absorption happens in the small intestine. Uh, and it takes uh, quite a while, between two and six hours, uh, to have complete absorption of alcohol. You probably got from the accent that I'm not from around here. My father is from Spain, by the way, they drink a lot there. Uh, and he also used to say that there's nothing free in America. So if you go to a bar, you get a lot of free stuff. Peanuts, chips, pretzels. Why is that? Thirsty. Somebody says thirsty, right? Anybody else wants, well, salt goes with 30, OK? Anybody else wants to? What part? What part? He said it slows the absorption of alcohol. Which part of the pretzels does that as the key? is the fat, is not the salt. Our body is pretty smart. If you get thirsty, you actually want water, not alcohol. Alcohol itself is a diuretic, right? So it makes you go to the bathroom more. You get even more dehydrated. Your body wants water. Fat delays the absorption of, uh, of alcohol. So the reason they give us free stuff is so you can then have fatty content in your stomach which would slow down the absorption. And it means that because it takes you longer to feel uh, drunk, you will drink more. It's also another reason why they are so fast serving your drinks and the appetizers were very slow on the dinner. Um, one thing that you need to know is that women take, uh, cannot take alcohol as well as men, and that is a scientific fact. It usually takes a woman about one drink less than a man in order to have the same intoxicating effect. And that is regardless of almost anything else you can do except for gastric surgery. Uh, there are about five tablets that are like really important for you guys to know from tonight, and this is one of them. Um, so usually around 0.05 on the blood alcohol scale uh, or blood alcohol concentration, people start getting kind of the impairment, the neurological impairments of alcohol. You get a bit ataxic, you get slow reaction time, and you're not so good at the wheel. When you get by 0.8 or 80, you uh, not do so well, which is why this is our uh, limit here in the United States for, drink, uh, for driving. When you get by 0.2, you get confused, and some people will pass out. By 0.3, then this is by now 300. I think it's the scale that you use this hospital, right? 80, 100, 300. Uh, by 300, you get you know, some stupor and hypothermia by um, 400, you get some anesthesia and unconsciousness. By 500, you get alcoholic coma. And most people will be dead by 600. I just put a patient on our benzosparing protocol uh, three days ago with a blood alcohol level of 657. It took five individuals to put this patient down. How is that possible? 
habituation, right? So the important thing is not just the absolute level, but what that patient's level usually is. So if I walk around the face of the earth with a blood alcohol level of 300, 600 is nothing. So when you think about that, that patient was found unconscious on the streets of Palo Alto, where I work, about 12 hours prior to being, uh, to being seen by me. The ER assumed the patient obviously do, looked drunk, so they did not draw a blood alcohol level on admission. The blood alcohol level that I got, 647, was at least 10 hours later. So you take 647 and then take 15, multiply by 10, and, and that is the patient's true blood alcohol level, right? So the blood alcohol level drops by about 15 points per hour. So you have 150 blood alcohol level, takes 10 hours to go down to zero, which is what this slide says. Remember that alcohol metabolism is a zero order kinetics. There's nothing you can do to slow down or to accelerate it. And this is just exactly what I, what I just said to you. So the other, the second most important slide in this presentation is this slide. Because I want to misspell some uh, myth about alcohol withdrawal. It's not always a continuum of alcohol withdrawal where you go from being intoxicated to be slightly um, tremulous and then to go through you know, severe withdrawal and DTs. This is about 80% of patients who have alcohol withdrawal. This blue curve is what we call minor alcohol withdrawal, and I, all, I love all terms. The old term for this is the shakes. And the reason it's called the shakes is because you shake. And the shakes are caused by increased autonomic activity. So you will have tremor, you will have a bit of diaphoresis, you have some mild elevations of heart rate and blood pressure, but 80% of the patients will never progress from that. So they peak about the second day of the shakes, and then it takes about 10 to 12 days to disappear. And along with that, about 80% of the patients will have insomnia or difficulty sleeping otherwise. Those patients do not progress to DTs. So if you were to start everybody who has a history of alcohol use and presents with the shakes, on a CIWA protocol, which I hate, then you have the problem that you're going to be treating, over treating 80% of the patients that present to your emergency room. Does that make sense? I'm going to talk about how to differentiate the two of them in a second. So that's the shakes. The second important one is what we call run fits or alcohol withdrawal seizures, scary stuff. It is probably one of the few times when I think for you to use a benzo it will be okay. So if I see somebody seizing, no matter what, I will give them five milligrams of uh, Valium or two milligrams of Arivan. That's, uh, that's not a question. But I can't really think of many other times when somebody should use a benzo. And mind you, I'm a psychiatrist, and psychiatrists usually love benzos. But I'll tell you why benzos are so bad in a second. Um, so as you can see, um, alcohol withdrawal seizures or fits happened relatively early, 12 to 48 hours uh, after the cessation of alcohol, or to drop the blood alcohol level by a factor of about 20%. So remember, the number is not 80, is whatever the patient starts at. So about three years ago, well, it probably was seven years ago, just before we started with EPIC, um, we had a patient who was camping with her husband and family, and she presented to our hospital um, ready for Halloween. By that I mean she was as, as um, punking as a, you know, as a punking is, right? I mean, that or whatever, what color is that? Orange. orange. Yes. <laughs> she was as orange as a punkin. Um, the, rest, the intern asked her, what, uh, how much do you drink? And surprisingly, she was honest. She said that she drank one gallon of wine a day. Um, she already was having mild symptoms of alcohol withdrawal. So the resident very appropriately wrote in big, bold letters, this patient is at extremely high risk for alcohol withdrawal, so please give one milligram of lorazepam every four hours, PRN, and then she listed all the vital signs for which the patient should receive that. That's your standard CIWA protocol, although she used it by vital signs rather than by CIWA score, 
Is it, anybody does that here? No? Do you guys let them? You do? Okay. Just wanted to know how, how cruel you guys are <laughs> by not giving medication to people. Anyway, so she did all the, what appears to be the right things, right? That patient had a grand mal seizure 25 minutes later, and her vital signs never got to be as bad as you will give the medication for. And the reason for that is this. DTs doesn't happen until here, and I'll show you that in a second. So we need to understand better the pathophysiology of alcohol withdrawal rather than just treat the symptoms, which is what we all have done. Until seven years ago, when I, I came up with the benzo spurring protocol, I wrote the benzo-based protocol for, for Stanford, which was the best thing ever for 18 years. That's what I think, uh, because I wrote it. Um, but you know, it was, it was pretty successful. Now remember, only about 3% of the patients will have more than one seizure, and uh, they stop. This is alcoholic hallucinosis in green here. Uh, as you see, it happened relatively early. Uh, before the fifth day of alcohol withdrawal. Uh, by definition, it means that the patient is having hallucinations in the presence of a completely intact sensorium. Otherwise, they will be delirious, right? So if they're confused and they're delirious and they're hallucinating, these patients are completely intact, just like you and I, they're just seeing or hearing things. And by the way, pink elephants is not very common. Whatever I don't really know who invented that. Uh, the most common hallucinations on patients with alcoholic hallucinosis are auditory hallucinations, and they tend to be paranoid in nature. And many of these patients end up killing themselves because of the hallucinations. They're running away from people that do not exist and jump out of the window and accidentally kill themselves. Now, this is the scary one, DT or delirium tremens, alcohol withdrawal delirium. The combination of rum fits and alcohol withdrawal delirium is what we call severe alcohol withdrawal. And that is what I want you to pay attention to. Everything else, it's honestly, is fluff. Uh, now, DTs are important to know, but look at that. The incidence of DT is only about 5%. So when you combine DTs and alcohol withdrawal seizure, we're talking about only about 18%, let's say 20% of the patient population. So if you get the worst alcoholics, only a one in out of five is going to go through severe withdrawal. And one of the important things is how to figure out the 80% who are going to go through minor withdrawal. You can treat them whichever way you want to, as long as you don't use a benzo. And then uh, the severe withdrawal, which I'm going to uh, share with you our protocol. Why do I care about this is this. The mortality rate for DTs is about 1%. Uh, of the patients who suffer it, unless you happen to be medically compromised. So if you have a patient who has severe medical problems, like many of our patients in the hospital, the mortality rate of DT jump to about 20%. It's about 28% in the ICU. So it's extremely important that we actually pay attention to them. So as I mentioned before, complicated alcohol withdrawal, as opposed to minor alcohol withdrawal, is a combination of rum feeds and DTs. And again, it happens in about 80% of the population. Sorry, 20% of the population. <coughs> so I, as I mentioned before, 80% of the patients will do perfectly fine. And, and I'm going to uh, share with you how we um, treat those patients at Stanford, not to be cruel with them. Now, if we use too much of other things, let's say benzos or bibitrates or propofol or whatever you like to use, there's a number of side effects that we need to be mindful of. Uh, for an over sedation, leading to the patient being transferred to the ICU for airway protection, uh, along with respiratory <coughs> depression, to falls, to disinhibition, uh, to provolone infusion syndrome, which we saw a patient not long ago being transferred from uh, a hospital around here to Stanford, to other problems. So let's talk briefly, because I, I want to acknowledge that we know all the things that you normally do and then why they're bad. I was jokingly saying that you know, your, our hosts are, are uh, prompting us to go through alcohol withdrawal because we have no alcohol served here, although some of those dark containers might have something that is medicinal in purpose. Um, this one said, the doctor says to the patient, mind you, only one out of 10 doctors will prescribe this, meaning alcohol. Uh, I think using alcohol is a horrible idea 
and there are many reasons why that is. It is true that if we keep on med medicating the patient with the alcohol, the patient will be fine. Now, if the patient tells you that they drink, as I had a patient the other day, who honestly said to me, I drink one case of beer a day, will you, honestly, will you prescribe a case of beer a day? 24 Budweiser's in a cooler at the bedside. <laughs> you probably won't. So what w how much will you feel comfortable giving the patient? One, so that patient will withdraw. Even if you give them six, a six pack, the patient will still withdraw. So then what's the point? Either do it or don't do it. And of course, there's a problem if you do it. And when I came to Stanford 25 years ago, you know, Stanford is, has some VIP patients among the population, which are a pain, in, a pain to treat. Um, so we had a, you know, we had a, a, a patient who was one of those VIPs and the surgeon, one of the orthopedic surgeons, actually prescribed a bottle of, of uh, wine at the bedside on a wine cooler. The patient went through withdrawal. You know why? He didn't like the brand, so he didn't drink it. <laughs> didn't taste well. That's the problem with VIPs, right? They have a much more refined taste than we do. Now, think about it. If you, if you have a patient who drinks a lot and, and his spouse has been nagging them to stop drinking forever, and then they finally the patient falls, breaks the hip, ends up in the hospital, you, the doctor, comes in and prescribes them alcohol so the patient will not go through withdrawal. The patient cracks the beer, opens, or the bottle of wine, and says to his uh, spouse, honey, prescribed by the best doctors at Dominican Hospital. Salud. <laughs> that patient will never stop drinking. You just prescribe them the sin. So we have to be mindful of that. If you want to use alcohol to prevent alcohol withdrawal, then you have to prescribe alcohol. You have to give the patient enough to raise the blood alcohol level to intoxication. So if you want to do that, go to town and get ready for a lawsuit. Um, but otherwise, don't use alcohol. Uh, in the old days, this is actual true advertisement from uh, when I was a resident. You know, we used to use things like Thoracine and other antipsychotics. It's one of the worst ideas ever uh, that I can think of, in part because Patients who go through alcohol withdraw, about 15% of them will develop symptoms of EPS or extrapyramidal symptoms, which are usually created by the use of antipsychotics. Uh, antipsychotics have zero, none, zero protective effect against alcohol withdrawal. Then, of course, there's barbiturates. And I was going to tell you a secret about barbiturates, but then I was going to say, don't quote me, and then I realized that they're taping me, so I can't <laughs> tell you. Okay, I wrote this in the paper anyway. Um, <laughs> if you're not going to listen to what I say and not use a GABAergic agent, then phenobarbital is far superior than any benzodiazepine you can think of. Don't quote me on that. I will say that he dubbed the tape and it was not me. <laughs> now, there's some really important things to realize about the use of medications for alcohol withdrawal. And um, I'm going to move here. Just because I want to point out this. This is, wow, this is powerful. This is the GABA receptor. I, I don't know how to do that. Is that better? Uh, can I just speak loud? Is that, okay. Um, alcohol do, do not substitute, sorry, benzos do not substitute for alcohol, right? So what happens is this is the GABA receptor. And the GABA receptor, there's a, there's a small place there where the actual molecule of GABA binds to. So when somebody takes a barbiturate, a benzodiazepine, or alcohol, what happens is that those particles, that's a benzo receptor, that's a barbiturate receptor, and then there's an alcohol receptor. When those particles bind to that receptor, it opens the receptor so it makes it easier for GABA to bind itself. They do not replace GABA. And it's important that you remember that alcohol, benzos, barbiturate do not replace GABA, because then that becomes a key for the treatment that I'm going to tell you later. So 
How many of you, and be honest now, have had a patient who is going through alcohol withdrawal, you give them a truckload of benzos and they still withdraw on you? And the reason for that is you're missing the second key. So if you ever had a, a um, box in the bank, for those of you who make money, you know how you need two keys, right? You need the banker's key and you need your key. You put both keys in, you turn it in. When you're giving a patient a benzo, you're only using one key. The other key is GABA. And there's a problem with alcoholic patients and GABA, which we're going to go to.